Hello attendees, this is Tom Wilson, Chairman of the Glasgow PWI branch. Um, welcome to our uh, second proper online only meeting. Um, go through some domestic arrangements, hopefully you're all safely tucked up, nice and warm in your own homes um, and are well enough to, to uh, attend this presentation and you've got a drink of some sort in your hand. Uh, what have I got? I've got a Coors Light, which is uh, in a glass, well, in the bottle, and I'll be partaking of that as we go. You may uh, see a little pop-up screen on your, uh, whatever you're watching the presentation on, and there's a, a, some grey bars on that one, is called questions. If you need to ask any questions of the presenter throughout the presentation, We'll take the questions at the end, but do feel free to type a question in there at the start. And Jim Watson, uh, Secretary, if you could just open the question box and just say hello in that question box, I'll know that that system is working and that you can hear me. And while you're doing that, Jim, I'm going to put you in the spot. I'm now going to ask you, have you any apologies for this evening? And if we have, uh, can you type the names in the chat box and that's the other box then the bottom where we can chat to each other the audience uh, will remain muted throughout uh, at the end we'll go through the questions if there are any and then we can open up for a general chat okay um tonight's paper is called sustainable infrastructure renewals and it's been delivered by brian beck a little bit about Brian. Brian's early career began with working at Yarrow's as an apprentice plater shipwright, which he enjoyed until the early 90s, when he took up roles in project management and engineering in the petrochemical and oil industry in the Middle East, before returning to the UK energy and engineering industry. Brian's been a member of the PWI for around 15 years now, joining well with First Engineering. Yes, like many good people, he was a member of First Engineering's team. Uh, and he started there in 2004, working in the plane line track design team, and then laterally as a project engineer. He moved to a health and safety environmental role in network rail track renewals, and after completing uh, his master's degree in energy and environmental management, he was promoted to his current role, working as the environment manager in the infrastructure projects division and he's been there for the last five years. His area covers Scotland and LNE regions, and he provides a strategic approach to the sustainability and environment for projects, whilst influencing national policy and clients to increase the awareness of the importance of sustainable development. He's also a STEM ambassador, working with local schools and other organisations, and is currently the chair of the West of Scotland IOSH Environment Group and as Chair of the Clyde Amphibian and Reptile Group with an accredited license for GCNs. There you go. This paper tonight is called Sustainable Infrastructure Renewals and hopefully you can see the screen. And I'll hand the meeting over to you, Brian. Hello, oh, good evening. I uh, hope everybody can hear me fine. And uh, I'll just open the, the chat so that if there's anything that you need to make me aware of, whether you can see or, or cannot hear properly, you can let me know. Um, and thanks very much for the invitation from Jim to come along tonight. So I'm going to talk about uh, sustainable infrastructure renewals, um, where we got an idea off of uh, David's story a number of years ago about potential reuse of ballast. Um, touch briefly on some projects we've, we've had on the go. Um, and that will include Aberdeen to Inverness, uh, but I'll only kind of uh, touch on that briefly because we, we had an excellent uh, presentation from Robert and Mark previously on those. And then I'll uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing at Queen Street. And then uh, I'll, I'll open up with questions. Thanks. As I mentioned uh, back uh, almost 10 years ago, I had a conversation with David Story in passing about how we could think about reusing ballast in traditional uh, renewals works rather than high output works. And uh, that set me on a, a path where eventually I did 
um, ballast reuse and optimization um, as uh, my dissertation on my master's. Um, what, what we first sat down and talked about is uh, the whole kind of aspect of reuse on site. Um, and you can see there's a lot of uh, interconnectivity between all the different uh, aspects of a site uh, production line. I mean, at the centre, it's ballast reuse, but we've got production, transport, general risks, health and safety, engineering compliance, and environmental risks. But amongst all that, there's the opportunities as well. So we've linked in directly where there can be improvements between train plans and logistics, um, cost benefits um, in the environmental world is a sustainable development and hazardous waste reduction, um, pollution runoff, and statutory nuisance. And uh, I know everybody will be very aware about the impacts of dust, noise, and vibration. Um, and uh, on the health and safety, and it's not just the, the, the site stuff, um, I guess the, the recent um, conditions that we're working under just now has opened up freight paths. Um, but what, what I was thinking about at the time is um, reducing the travel. Um, if we can reuse ballast on site, it means that we don't have staff having to travel about the country um, and again if, if there's uh, aspects of uh, an overrun and uh, having to go from up north to down south to go home again and all those uh, other time away from base impacts. So that was really kind of the big picture we wanted to look at and where there was the dotted line. Um, if we think about methods on site, Traditionally, on a, a normal construction site out with the rail industry or out with the, the P-way infrastructure corridor, you could maybe use a, a Riddler or front bucket, and we could investigate that opportunity um, back in the day. Um, but it might be a change to the way we work, and I'll touch on that later on in the slides. So the aim and objective and scope of what I was looking at at the time is what we wanted to do um, and the why and the how. So it's all about adhering to a, a hierarchy of the waste principles. So on the higher uh, levels rather than the bottom couple of steps where we're sending materials off site altogether. The why was the, the need to reduce the waste and related carbon emissions to meet our obligations. And uh, again, during the transport phase, to meet the, the governmental aspirations um, that have come to the fore in the last couple of years. Um, and those, those were under the various uh, Conference of Parties meetings, so kicking off from the Kyoto summit through to Brazil, Paris, and had things gone to plan, it would have been November, the Conference of Parties 26 was coming to Glasgow talk about how we can better enhance the, the climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, and the how, well, the, the how would really have been down to the likes of David's story of Craig, Craig Bartley's at the time on identifying where we could apply this, um, suitable sites while adhering to basic engineering specs and following precautionary principles. Uh, that's basically where we don't take a risk. So we don't, don't want to take an overrun. We don't want to put in shoddy, shoddy engineering principles. So it's, it's adhering to those good PMA standards and uh, the track design handbook that we, we all work with. Um, and I guess a big part of that would have been long-term planning and logistics and how we can uh, actually deliver that on site. And one of the great uh, challenges and in fact, uh, learning, good learning curves for me back in the day um, was going into the whiteboard meetings and actually seeing how the, the consist of the trains and the wagons and uh, the yellow plant coming into and out of sight was managed. So again, more of the why. So we've got current laws applied, we've got a new order at number 10. So 
We're going to talk about less funds and higher tax. We don't know. Um, we've got a major disruptor to the economy just now. Uh, we don't know what the horizon is going to look like as we come out of this. Um, more robust um, carbon and other gases emissions limits. Future legislation. Um, Again, a ballpark figure uh, I had looked at um, back at the end of CP4 and into CP5 was uh, I think we could make a realistic saving around about £4 million, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the moment. And of course, um, the big thing uh, now this year is uh, the current plans of governments on decarbonisation, both UK wide and Scotland wide. Uh, and again, future reasons, you know, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll be up against it as a public body now. We're scrapping for funding with the, the likes of the health service, who've been doing a marvellous job recently. Um, and we, we have to be more efficient in how we deliver things. Uh, I don't know how high on the agenda the decarbonisation will be in relative terms now as we come out of this, but again, it's something that is still very high on most, if not all, government's agendas. And that's just a little timeline of where we've come from uh, in the early days. Uh, so the, the red line you see there is um, the taxes. Um, th those took a huge jump um, throughout period four into, sorry, throughout CP4 into CP5, but they've had a steady increment and they've got a continued increment in the future. New laws and fines, again, I think with new laws coming in, uh, the, the, the impact of pollution to air and the statutory nuisance I touched on earlier, we, we could see ourselves uh, exposed to additional um, fines uh, due to legislation. And then the blue line, the funding, uh, uh, already mentioned how we'll be scrapping against other governmental departments. Um, it's it's got a long term decline, I guess. We can see that in recent years the move has been away from enhancements to renewals. So that might continue into the future. Again, I mentioned engineering compliance. Um, this this was more for a kind of financial audience, uh, but it's when we'd moved to the old, from the old categories to the new categories and formation treatment. And it's not just kind of random, it would have to involve careful scrutiny of formation where we can make the most benefit. Um, some renewals are required because the, the ballast formation is degraded so much that we wouldn't be able to make any real reuse on site. So it's that kind of thing. Uh, I suppose it's scoping sites out as well as trying to scope sites in because not all site, not all sites would be suitable and not all conditions would be suitable. Um, and again, the, the consequences, if we didn't adhere to engineering compliance, there would be production loss, reputation loss, cost importation, imported. If we think about not, not achieving the engineering compliance, it would be temporary or permanent speed restrictions. Uh, well, that, that's the kind of impact we, we, we potentially look at. I've um, got a couple of uh, sample, core samples here, um, and I know sampling's changed nowadays, but looking at the right hand side, there's pretty poor formation right the way through, but on the left hand side, as you look at the screen, there seems to be a bit more reusable or serviceable ballast depth, uh, and the idea would be reuse that to perhaps put on the bottom formation um, and build up new ballast on top. Um, and that way we're limiting the reuse, or oh, sorry, we're limiting the use of virgin aggregate rather than reuse. Uh, going to be a bit controversial here, if anybody with a high output hat on. Um, as engineers, are you happy with what gets returned back into the track? Um, too many fines and slurry returned, possibly, or maybe not. Um, I'll, I'll maybe maybe leave that open to discussion um, and uh, see see how the, the audience feels about that. But uh, some of some of the returns I've seen when we were, were working behind the, the uh, ABC 
um, it, it wasn't great. So why why we use just so I, me I mentioned the the production of the raw material. This was from a, a research a visit to Mount Sorrel Quarry. I uh, did a bit of a field trip there. Um, the picture on the left, as you look at it, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor hovering over that or not, but the picture on the left is a drilling rig. Um, they're consuming around 70 litres of fuel an hour. Uh, the photograph in the middle on the right hand side, they've got the, the Terex RH120, um, the, the big digging machine, and uh, I didn't get a didn't get a picture of it in here. Oh, yeah, just down on the right hand side of the middle picture, you see a, a spherical object. That's a steel ball. And if um, some, some of the, the blasting material from the quarry is, is too big to fit in the truck, they lift that ball up and smash it down onto the offending rock to try and break it into smaller pieces or pieces small enough to, to fit into the dumper truck. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's dwarfing that drum, dumper truck, um, and it, it goes through around 170 litres an hour, uh, producing producing the material. Um, and it's not that the dumper trucks we uh, those tyres are around about 10 or 12 foot um, in diameter. So uh, you can you can then put into perspective the size of these two two uh, diggers. And the dumper trucks themselves, there's 10 of them servicing the, the diggers uh, continuous cycle. And again, those trucks each are using 70 litres an hour. So the total fuel usage was around about 1,250 litres an hour. Um, and the rate of production on two to two and a half thousand tonnes of ballast power, there was less than two tonnes of ballast, or sorry, two tonnes of raw material um, coming out the ground per litre. Um, I didn't have the, the facts and figures for the actual crushing part of the operation, but Network Rail, as a client of Mount Sorrow, we take up between 30 and 40 percent of their production, and the energy cost um, for crushing the, the larger rock into uh, the nominal size for the ballast uh, was three million pounds to four million pounds per year. So we we would take up around two million pounds, well, sorry, one and a half to two million pounds per year of that in cost to produce it. Uh, performance report review is kind of end of control period that it came out. Um, CP5 again was, uh, sorry, CP4 and CP5 was, um, at that time we were sending 200,000 tonnes plus the landfill. The landfill tax at the time was £48 pounds a tonne. That was uh, around about eight and a half million pounds. And again, I, if you look at the graph, the, the flight path that was taken, um, the, the landfill tax was increasing year on year and is increasing year on year uh, of, by eight pounds a tonne. So you imagine that's compounded. So if it started off at 1.7 million, Five years ago, it will be up 2.4, 2.5 million pound this year with that, with that uh, compound cost. Uh, we managed, however, uh, kind of good news side of that to divert um, over 600,000 tonnes, saving 25 million pounds in landfill tax alone. So if, if we can get to that place where we're reusing material, either on site or as part of another job, then that, that's where we want to be going. <coughs> The recycling targets throughout the, the last 10 years as well have been increasing 5% per annum um, and we're up to 95% recycling and diversion from landfill at the moment. Uh, I again compounded the 2.6 million pounds in landfill tax back, back uh, when we started measuring that. Um, the landfill tax now is up to 84 pounds a year. Again, other site reuse, um, typical fuel consumption for a class 66 unit. Um, you get an average of seven and a half litres or, or one and a half gallons of fuel used every mile. Um, if we do a round trip, 
you're talking about 690 gallons used to go from Kingmoor to Aberdeen um, to deliver that. Um, again, arguably more efficient than if we'd taken it by road, but there would have been the other other quarries closer if we'd gone by road. So talking about from the central belt up to Aberdeen. And on that, um, we talked about the last couple of years, uh, the Aberdeen Inverness ballast efficiencies, the recovery, treatment, and reuse on site. Uh, the, the makeup of, of ballast is quite often because uh, this track is needing renewed. I've had lots of maintenance on it to keep it in a serviceable condition or an operational condition. So actually quite a lot of the top ballast and certainly within the beds and the shoulders would be new material uh, and a traditional relay if we're in a short or tight possession we'd be sending that material away off back down to Kingmore for a uh, treatment or recovery down there so again the, the, there's probably a, a good percentage of the, the, the top 400 millimeters um, or a, certainly above the sleeper bed uh, sorry the sleeper base that is serviceable or almost new. Um, so Aberdeen, Tenderness, because of the change in working and taking the blockade, um, we're able in that first year to recover 10,000 tonnes and reuse it on site. Um, and if I go to the next slide, we, we saved um, around about 27,000 kilograms of CO2 on that production I was talking about at, at Mount Sorrel, um, for example, uh, without the processing impacts um, factored in there. Uh, and the transport emissions for the vehicles coming from uh, the central belt up to Aberdeen, um, that would have had uh, an impact of 160,000 kilograms of CO2. Um, and, and it was a busy site with a, the amount of uh, lorry journeys locally anyway. Um, but removing that additional traffic from from the central bill up to Aberdeen and Inverness was uh, substantial. Uh, and again, that, that's equivalent to 169 tonnes of CO2 saved. Uh, and again, subject to how the modal delivery option was selected, there's a uh, lorry versus um, train, there was a region of taking the, all those truck journeys off the road. We, saved £50,000 and uh, the change in the landfill tax regs um, would have meant that we saved in the region of £20,000 with those lorry journeys taken out of the equation. Year two, basically we had two and a half times um, of ballast reused and a local quarry was reopened after uh, jumping through all the quality control hoops. Um, I've used uh, around 9,000 tonnes from the local quarry on site. Um, but again, overall, the combined saving of the transport removed 500 tonnes of carbon from from the the work uh, the work scope. And again, just uh, extrapolating up the estimated cost savings, you're talking about saving 135,000 pounds. Um, you could argue it's not a lot on the scope of the project, but actually if, every penny we kind of claw back is demonstrating value for money, especially now um, when it's the National Audit Office that, that looks at how we um, spend the, the taxpayers' money. So issues and concerns, I've mentioned opportunity, there's environmental and business benefits in both waste and commercial efficiencies. For linear meters, you're looking at saving a, a minimum, I would say, of a quarter of material cost, probably closer to 40 percent, depending on the, the quality of the ballast um, and the beds and the shoulders. Um, reduces uh, traffic, saves in delivery costs, frees up valuable resource in terms of driver, and if we've not got as many trains on the infrastructure, it frees up pathways for the freight operators to, to take up those slots or uh, if, if the demand is there for the train operators. Um, again, as mentioned, the uh, reduction in CO2 and equivalent 
uh, future proofs against new taxes and legislations. The risks would be managing those, would be train management, route availability, points managing, um, obviously a big thing, uh, make sure we don't run through those. Um, if we've got more, more excavation going on in site um, and the timings of possessions, um, but again, I mentioned the whiteboards, uh, part of my introduction, uh, I, I don't see those as being insurmountable um, for, for planning um, opportunities. And a little bit of legal bit in there. So in Scotland, we've retained the, what they call paragraph, paragraph 34 waste exemption. So we can actually keep a deposit ballast on land um, where we produce it. Um, so if we wanted to reuse ballast for dressing the shoulders or whatever we might want to do with it, then we can. Um, and you're looking at 10 tonnes per linear metre of spent ballast we can keep on site. So even if we're not introducing uh, efficiencies, or we're still having to bring in new virgin material, we can make a saving on removing excess material from site that we don't have to, if, if there's an opportunity, or more so if there isn't any space constraints that we can leave it on site. And uh, a real reason that's important, because uh, part of this conversation is um, talking about sustainability. Um, Mount Sorrow, part, part of the, the outcome when I visited there and some of the research I did is at the time of around about 30 40 years supply only from that quarry um, before it was exhausted. Um, and interestingly, it's, it's almost in the middle of a village and next to a, a, a site of special scientific interest, so an officially sensitive um, or statutory designated site. Um, for environmental constraints. But if we were able to save that 25% of material, you would extend the, the life cycle of this quarry by another 10 years. 40%, you're looking at 15 to 20 years. So it's important that when, when logistics of getting materials, and, and I know it's PPE, it's in the news just now, but it's important to understand that Important material would be a big, big factor to consider and probably off, um, offset any gains in CO2 savings uh, and, and result in a negative impact. I, I'd already mentioned the cost of breaking up and the, again, benefits on site. Uh, the guys are having to do much longer shifts. Um, we talk about a work life balance and, and how people are looking to have sort of, sort of working days. Um, if you like, uh, then, then we have this running a 12-hour shift plus a six days a week. So that, that could be reduced, relieving fatigue on the workforce or, and uh, improving the, the impacts on the local villagers. Uh, so another case study, um, Queen Street Station, um, during the demolition phase, we, we had sat and at the, the point of going into the invitation to tender, um, it was at grip stage six. For those of you are familiar with that process, um, there wasn't too much I could do because the designs had already been signed off and the plans were already in place, but there was a couple of aspects where I could make um, an impact at that stage. One was how we manage demolition, the other was installing um, low energy, uh, low carbon lighting on the, on the new uh, platform area. So focusing on the, the demolition phase, we had 100% of it inert material, so your brick, your concrete, um, any flagging stones and stuff like that, we were able to reuse 100%. 94% of the mixed waste was also diverted from landfill. Um, and again, this is uh, listed directly from Demmaster's recent presentation they did. Um, so I guess uh, when we're able to tell, they're telling that story to us, satisfying our client, then we can tell the same story to the funders of Transport Scotland. Um, and again, it's uh, a good news story. Um, so the, the, the teams there, they worked around 26,000 hours, 14,000 tonnes of material. Um, part of getting the, 
the requirement and the invitation to tender. The benefit was a, a Dem Master moved their, a, their MRF, so the material recovery facility. They moved that from Wishaw um, to a Charles Street, just beside the canal at Port and Das, and reduced the round trip by 58 miles per vehicle. So with the, the number of vehicles involved, I think we're talking nearly a thousand lorry loads of demolition waste. Um, probably, probably slightly more because the way the steel was cut up, they couldn't take a full 20 ton load off site. So they were operating with reduced, uh, reduced loads. But, but basically we, we managed to cut off um, 46 uh, tons of CO2 emissions from the transport impact. Um, and the productivity uh, of new versus reused material on other projects around about Glasgow was 70 tonnes of CO2 and equivalent. Now that's important because uh, the big thing that's on the horizon and has been getting talked about more and more is a thing called a circular economy approach. Whereas in the past, we would produce the material from Mount Sorrel or any other quarry. We would use it on site and when it was redundant, um, it was taken off site to waste or maybe get a further treatment down at Kingmoor um, or Whitemoor, I should say, where our uh, facility uh, for treating the waste is down there. That's, that's a linear material use model. Um, where we want to get to is a circular economy approach where we produce material, it has its life cycle, and at the end of life, it gets reused elsewhere, preferably locally. So the, the material from the project, we had companies buy the material, treat it uh, in Glasgow, um, and it was exported. Generally, it would go to China, um, again, very topical, um, but it, it would be it, the volumes. The volumes in the UK now are not sufficient <clears throat> to justify reusing and treating it here. So there's, there's that um, that negative impact of exporting it locally. Um, other timber um, purchasers or procurers. Um, were, were listed, um, and again, that was part of the agreement at the, the start of the tender phase, or early, early once the tender had been awarded. Um, one of the novel things they used it for, uh, the, the timber on site, they used to construct their airtight chambers and uh, uh, clean versus dirty areas when they were removing asbestos. Um, when that was done, um, that was taken off site and had to, some of it had to go away with waste because it was uh, cross contamination with, them, uh, with asbestos. But other timber was uh, chipped for biomass um, and used within the UK or converted into cattle bedding because it wasn't worth recovering. You know, it was too, too old um, or it, it wouldn't have the the engineering specifications to, to take loads anymore, so it, it wasn't fit for purpose. Um, and uh, the inert secondary material, so again, they, they crushed it to uh, 6 f two and 6 f 5 grade, um, a nominal um, aggregate size at the, the recited MRF. Uh, and again, it was used in uh, sub-bases and housing, other construction projects, road network projects, um, because it contained an element of fines, which is easily compact. And again, we've, we've managed to track where it went and how it was reused within that circular economy model. Again, we've just got some figures to summarise what was used. And the uh, uh, first table there, the, the main important thing to me is not so much just the volumes, um, on the right hand table, but it's actually the percentage of material reused and diverted from landfill. Again, we did some costing when, uh, when we looked at this, um, and uh, I'm not sure what the future looks like, and perhaps some of you in, in the call or sorry, in the presentation will be able to tell me, but 
a bit of a quick ready reckoner based on a plain line work bank um, of 400 kilometres of ballast within that composite kilometre uh, length. The, the material benefits of the potential of at least £4 million pound and removing the, the delivery cost to the benefit of £2 million. Pound. Um, at that point, we hadn't quantified the reduction of tonnes um, per site. Um, again, just summarising, the lifespan of the quarry would be increased by at least 25%, and materials production costs and emissions reduced proportionately. So that, that's kind of summarising the opportunities. If we embed that, it's a, a good way to trial it. Um, the, the change in working practices. So when we look at future, um, how, how are we going to proceed? Are we going to stick to those risks of short possessions where we couldn't um, implement that opportunity? Um, or are we going to consider the future projects that are almost on a campaign basis rather than a site by site basis? Could we have that blockade approach applied again? Um, one of the future sites where we be able to make uh, use of that quarry that was reopened up at, up at Aberdeen, um, where the, the new station at Dow Cross next to Inverness Airport is going to go and just off the a96 and thanks for listening thank you very uh, much uh, that, that was absolutely fantastic um i've been monitoring the the questions box i don't have any uh, typed questions in there please feel free to open up the questions and type a question if you have one and while you're thinking about that before i open up the microphones can I just uh, take the opportunity and to ask you a couple of questions myself, Brian? Yes. Um, first of all, recycling. We talked a lot about recycling, recycling ballast. One of my uh, observations as a looking out the train window when traveling used to be in vogue was the number of concrete sleepers that are lying in piles at the side of the track in uh, short-term storage, you would imagine, at access points. Is there any value in recycling concrete sleepers, crushing them to remove steel and cast? Or is it is it, uh, yeah. is it no benefit? Yeah, there is. Um but I, I, I guess it's it's always looked at a cost um angle rather than the, the CO2 saving. Uh, but that might change with the whole decarbonisation thing. There's a new British standard, the uh, PAS twenty eighty. Um and it's all about your commitments to reducing uh, carbon impacts within the infrastructure. Um, what what gets me is it's not just so much as sleepers or rail, um, because it, those are kind of jump out at you. Um, when when I was uh, travelling regularly to York and beyond for the LNE part of my portfolio, uh, it was leftover rail units from level crossings. Um, we actually had donated some of those to a plant operating company to use in their uh, training centre. Uh, we've got some sitting up at Carnoustie just now that came out of uh, that project, and we're hoping that the, the maintenance team uh, will be able to reuse those in their growth. Um, there's nowhere, local, no, nowhere in the UK that would be able to recycle those um, if we were to refurbish them for reuse. They would they would go over to Germany, but again, thinking on that hierarchical approach, if we can reuse them for their intended purpose, albeit not on the operational railway, then that would be a benefit. If we could somehow adopt uh, an access and reuse panels, for example, at an access, that would be ideal as well. Uh, and I think um, again, when I had my, my secondment and maintenance as an environment specialist there. Uh, down at um, Dumfries, I think it was, the local team took the concrete BOMAG units and used them to build a footpath from the access point back into the delivery unit, the depot. So um, there's lots of people get lots of good ideas. It's just teasing it out of them or uh, asking people to speak up. Yeah, 
And, yeah. and I think that's just people identifying and becoming, as you said, more aware of recycling. I think we were all used to different coloured bins sitting at our, our back doors, and we recycle as much as we can of our household <laughs> waste. But recycling in the workplace, I think, uh, we really need to raise the profile as that. One of the things that you touched on uh, in your recycling presentation is, okay, it's now a fact of life at home, but uh, it's not always been so. We used to be the throwaway society. So what actually prompted your initiative with uh, First Engineering? Was it specifically the money, that, that £4 million price tag of, of recycling, or was it was it something you know, to do with the environment? Uh, well, for me, it was the environmental aspect because by that point I had moved up up uh, up the stairs, as it were, at Sukeld Street, um, and it was just a passing conversation with, with David uh, Story, uh, and I think it was really to make the traditional renewals more competitive with, um, with that kind of high output approach, really. Um, and reusing ballast that way. Um, the CO2 impacts, yeah, they, they were they were a secondary consideration. It's only when I started looking then and I had that mind map when you seen the interconnectivity between the fatigue um, and the other opportunities. Um, and, and then the, the, the thing that in discussions had surprised other folk was not, not considering that the, the long-term impacts would be well, we've run out of ballast locally. You know, where, where are we going to source the raw materials? Um, so the, I, I guess there was a combination of of those things uh, that, that, that added to that. Okay, I've got a question from the audience, Jeremy Reese on the audience. Uh, how was plasterboard recycled at Queen Street Station? Oh, you've got me there. <laughs> 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 I, I didn't know the detail of that one. Um, that it's a very difficult product to recycle, anyway. Um, but I would say that's potentially been some of the fines that, that broke down. Um, some of the concrete, the condition of it when when you opened up and you started breaking it, it, it wasn't terrific inside. Um, but I would have to go away and find out um, how that was done. I was thinking maybe there wouldn't be so much plasterboard at Queen Street other than in the station buildings itself uh yeah yeah there is that um again a lot of, a lot of that if it, if it can get crushed down and reused um as part of the general waste that would would go down that route okay and another question uh from richard beavis says surely a good use for recycling concrete sleepers would be in depots and sidings and perhaps terminal station platforms Disappointing to see that new materials often specify for these locations, and I can sympathise with that, having tried to get serviceable concrete sleepers for the new siding at Blackford to try and do that good news story for Transport Scotland. Couldn't get, or it was actually more cost effective to get new sleepers delivered to site than pay for the same price for a serviceable sleeper delivered to site. Have you got an opinion on that? Yeah, yeah, um, you're, you're spot on. Um, I think uh, some some recent works without kind of, um, putting it any sites on the spot, but there's there's a lot of perhaps sidings or branch lines where serviceable materials can get cascaded. Um, again, if you're if you're producing serviceable sleepers on site that can get reused on site, that would be ideal. Um, and again, it might be more challenging specifications. Um, if, I, if I take that on to another example, I looked at when I first uh, started with the, the, the SPNC team, there was something like 1.8 kilometres of concrete troughing left over from uh, a major uh, enhancement, um, and it was through Inverkeithing. And Trying to trying to do the sales pitch of at least it'll be cost neutral reusing that material when it was easier for for the project manager to simply pick up the phone and and uh, via his suppliers or his, his principal contractor order in new 
Um, and again, we did we did have suppliers offer to come and clear that up for us, but then they would just resell the material back to Network Rail. Um, but but there are all sorts of things. Um, remember the Uptown Hedge after the the inspection pit and uh, the train inspection shed was getting removed. They took the the inspection pit concrete units and basically flipped those over. And that then became the base for one of the platforms at Airtown Head. Uh, again, I, I did quantify that at the time, but I, um, it, it just occurred to me that we'd actually done that then as well. A good example of local reuse, but maybe somebody might raise the question of product approval. Another question on, uh, you made reference to the questionable quality of recycled ballast on high output sites. Presumably, recycling a ballast on conventional track renewal sites would have to be segregated in a similar way. So, is it the case that better se separation systems are required to better uh, identify and segregate waste coming from site? Yeah, so um, what, one of the biggest challenges is, is um, probably make, make sure we're not causing a, an additional or a different type of pollution. So, airborne particulates. Um, when we're um, re recycling ballast on site, um, if the top top lot of layers you could actually scrape off, put to the side, or put in a wagon. Again, this is all where the the the, the, pardon me, the logistics and planning comes into it. Um, so if, if you're able to have more control of lifting that off on site, that would be good. But it might be a bit more time consuming. So that's that's the balance. Um, but I'd mentioned uh, some of the methods that are used on fixed construction sites where there are riddlers um, and these have dampened down mechanisms. I've even seen in a, 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 a building site where a skip has been used um, where they've recovered the material, used the, used the riddler bucket in the skip full of water and all the, the, the fines sink to the bottom of the skip and then you're left with reusable inert material. I must talk to you about my wet ballast screening idea. Uh, and on that subject of ballast screening, you mentioned that the fines and slurry that come off any type of ballast screener, you know, I guess, is, in my opinion, just not effective. It might be effective in placer land in the continent where maybe the, uh, the, the weather's a bit drier. But certainly in, certainly in Scotland, when you go ballast cleaning in Scotland, it's been raining that week and all you get is black porridge running off the screen because yeah. it just isn't effective at knocking off the fines. And you look at the return and you think there's more, well, 25% of what's going back in is just stuff that's adhering to the ballast. That's my opinion. Is that, is that what you've come across? Yeah, so I guess that's what I was referring to. Um, Again, when you think of some of the jobs in the GSW, how uh, how we do a lot of wet beds down there um, when we were doing the campaign down there, uh, and then closer closer to home as well, um, where we're we're getting that problem even in kind of semi-urbanised areas, not not just uh, out in rural areas. Um, but yeah, you're right. The, the the weather has an impact on that, and um, that's why it probably looks so bad going back into the ground. Because if you're being a, a, a purist, um, it's it's you're returning so many fines and you're you're not taking the whole problem away. Yeah, and on that same That's thing about fines and, and ballast, uh, certain quarries, uh, Mount Sorrow was one of one of my pet hates. So ballast from Mount Sorrow was always uh, face masks on, very dusty. Uh, do you think there's any advantage in having a look at the ballast specification and trying to reduce the allowable percentage of fines uh, to to try and get a chunkier size of stone and less dust in amongst it? Well, I never thought of that. that that's uh, yeah, certainly the, the the different nominal size would uh, would potentially help. Um, I'm just thinking. Um, it's the kind of thing I'm thinking about is you know, you're allowed two percent fines, two kilograms of dust, effectively, three yeah. millimeter down in dust, and amongst uh, 
a, a 100 kilogram sample. That's a lot of dust, and right. it's, it's right. going nowhere. And that's allowed. And I'm thinking, surely quarries could be persuaded, in terms of their quality control, to provide cleaned, properly cleaned ballast with the fines percentage washed away at source, and never actually leaving the quarry to be eventually somebody's ballast cleanings. Yeah, well, I, I was I was thinking more it's the loading procedures. So uh, you, you probably nailed that there. Um, that there should there should be some process whereby, but, and again, do we do we regularly inspect the the suppliers? I guess I guess um, it's a, a rhetorical question. It would be a supply chain organisation or my, my counterpart in that. Ian, Ian Russell, I would be asking that question to. Okay. Um, no more questions on the on the website on the on the typed up questions. I'm going to open the microphones now. This is a bold move for me, and try and unmute all the participants. Okay. So audience, you can unmute yourself and and say something. Brian Counter fifth in. Oh, nearly. Yeah, this was Brian Cancer here. Yes, uh, thank you, Brian. I, uh, I'm very pleased with your presentation. I didn't manage to see it all because of other things I was doing, but uh, you are going to help us in uh, in this process further on, I believe, in terms of you know carbonisation. Um, I just just going back to this thing about uh, recycled ballast. Um, it, it, do we do we actually have a place in Scotland to sort of distribute it into like other uses, like perhaps farmers and things like that? No, no. We used to have uh, the the site site in Miller Hill as the local distribution centre, but I guess that would be I'm seeing ten, maybe twelve years ago that we lost that facility. Yeah, the reason I'm asking the question is because there was always a bit of an issue over contamination, and I wonder where we where where we sat in that area. Uh, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That was probably uh, before um, I had get my teeth into that. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers. No worries. Hi there. It's a uh, Jim Watson. I'm basically following on on Brian Counter's uh, question there. Uh, it is interesting to note that uh, many years ago, Scotland not only had Miller Hill, but had a, a ballast recycling facility at Cadder Yard. Uh, of course, this has all moved down south now. Uh, so clearly there's an issue with both carbon and economics in transporting ballast from a renewal site in Scotland down to Kingmoor or, 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 or even March. Uh, so to me, there is a real need, I, not just for the railway industry, but for the construction industry to, to, to reopen some of the LDCs and uh, the ballast recycling facilities. I don't know if you have any comment on that, uh, Brian Beck? Yeah, yeah. Um... I uh, spoke with uh, a number of colleagues in the, the, the track planning, and they, at the moment, um, I'm just checking the, for my latest <laughs> at, at the moment, we're doing some development um, for the uh, Edinburgh Waverley Western approach and the new, new cord at Domeni. And um, rather than bringing in Virgin Aggregate, I want to uh, work with uh, the track renewals team to see if we can. Have some kind of logistics plan to reuse the uh, spent or serviceable ballast within the footprint, or certainly for a proportion of that, because I, I, I believe we're going to have to do a uh, considerable build up for embankments. Um, part of the design considerations is maybe having a, a great separation. Um, can we reuse um, poorer quality ballast within the aggregate mix of the concrete for? Casting the, the, the great separation on viaducts. Right. Yes, yeah, certainly. That, that that does sound a very practical thing, Brian. I I sort of go, going back to my, my own relatively recent past. I Swindon Campbell. I I reused uh, fifteen thousand tons of spent ballast 
from uh, the Yule and Triton World site uh, because it was able to be graded as class one N. So, so basically right. you're talking about stone ballast and ash. So yes, it's feasible if you can get the mix right. And that's yes. a huge, huge saving. You know, to be able to reuse, for example, on site, the, the 15,000 tons, you're talking about 235 falcons of spoil that otherwise would have been off site. Uh, huge, huge savings, both uh, in material and carbon. So I like your idea, great. On the, wide, on the wider construction industry front, um, it's recognised um, that we're probably throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater in, in some cases, um, as I alluded to, with the, the virgin material or, or um, new ballast that had, had gone off site after a maintenance run. Um, but even, even if I think about an, an embankment, if we can get a plan in that is acceptable for, from a quality control aspect, whereby we're preventing cross-contamination. So there's something called CLEAR, it's a reuse of material on site, and SIPA have moved the, uh, instead of we don't work off the old checklist, uh, checklist C anymore for ballast contamination, SIPA have, uh, and the uh, Environment Agency have got guidance on uh, thresholds of what can be considered non-contaminated now, so it can get reused. Um, in a recent one in Aberdeen and Inverness, we had some soil go off site that had uh, asbestos in it, but it wasn't classified as contaminated because the thresholds of that were so low from an environmental aspect that it could get reused. The, the, the trouble was that the health aspects were even more robust so we've got that challenge as well um but again thinking back on Eva, if, if we're able to put some kind of basin and maybe virgin material on top but we've got the core as reusable serviceable aggregate um where it's not going to be a threat to health for the environment and then we could reuse it that way a, a bit of a kind of a ballast sandwich if you like Thanks for that. Julian, you've got a question? Um, just one uh, a comment. Um, when I was down south uh, near Immingham, um, I do know that ABP did reuse uh, some sleepers and some old rails that were out of um, the NR specs in relaying some sidings there. Um, I believe in an ABP location, um, so obviously they can decide on their own their own specification. Um, I do think, as you know, having worked in Scotland, I do think it is a little ridiculous that we haven't got anything in Scotland um, for you know sorting out ballast uh, and other materials, rails, sleepers, etc. Between uh reusable and genuinely re uh not not reusable um and certainly yes yeah, so if we could get something further north rather than shipping it effectively all the way to march and potentially shipping it all the way back again um it would be sensible so if something could be done at um either cadder or um miller hill I think that's my personal opinion, and I come from the traffic yeah, car. Um, I think that'd be a, a really good, uh, really good move, and it would uh, decrease the costs for the Scottish renewals. Jeff McGee was trying to unmute, was having a bit of trouble with unmuting, but he's made the observation that Miller Hill reopened as an LDC over two years ago. Now, I don't know if that means that they do a limited amount of recycling or reclamation at Miller Hill. Yeah, yeah, I knew, I knew that had reopened. Uh, yeah, I knew, I knew that was on the cards, uh, but I, I don't have visibility of what uh, is actually happening with that in, in operational aspects, that is. And before I take another question, I'll, I'll use my uh, chairman's prerogative and, and have an observation that uh, there are several schemes around the country where track lowering is, is very much in vogue for electrification and uh, efficient electrification projects. 
uh, we've done a little uh, look at uh, changes of track form. So if you've currently got an overbridge with concrete sleeper track form and you need to lower the track there, then you can achieve a 200 mil lowering with no material removed from site or no new material brought to site if you change the track form from concrete to steel. And just by changing the track form, you're saving one ton per meter run of material removal or import. And that's quite a significant saving. And maybe, uh, Brian, you and I can have a chat, further chat about that to see how we can exploit that potential and try and get it more visibility of that potential to the masses or people that might be interested in such a saving. Okay, yeah. any more questions for now? Yeah, sorry, could you just repeat how much uh, saving you, how much um, track depth saving you could do on that? Was it, do you say 200 mil? That's it, up to 200 mil, you can do a 200 mil lower without having to right. do excavation that disturbs the subgrade. So you're using a Excellent. combination of the shallower carcass depth of your steel yes. sleeper. So you're going from a 204 typically to a 100. And then you've got a reduced requirement for ballast below that leading edge of the steel sleeper. Uh, so instead of 250 for concrete, you're going 150 for steel perhaps. You can't use it everywhere, yes. obviously not category no. one lines, but there are instances where that would be a perfectly acceptable solution and that one ton per meter run saving in excavation and imported material can be quantified into a cost somewhere and somebody could work, figure out uh, how much per meter run you would save in pounds. That would be, yeah, I mean, I can imagine the, um, you know, there might be certain places where you couldn't do with concrete sleepers at a track lower, therefore you get into a bridge rebuild. Um, and obviously that then the savings come into the millions then. So, oh, that's right. so, so we were looking at maybe not so much a bid rebuild, but installation of a, a trough, uh, a track yeah. trough to, to prop the, the bridge. It depends on the, the level, the magnitude of lowering we've discovered. So once you get to the magnitude of lowering that require um, excavation or foundation renewals of the structure, mm -hmm. then uh, there are savings to be made by okay, changing thanks. the, I'll, the I'll, track form. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll mention that figure to my contacts in Transport Scotland. They're always looking at uh, various okay, ways of uh, doing Just the figure to have in the back of your mind. And really Just people. mention the East Kilbride Project. They'll know, they'll know the one. It's called East Kilbride Project. There you go. Oh, right, okay, anyway, awesome. Question for you, Jim. Well, following, Jim. following on in that comment, Tom, uh, and Brian, of course, uh, it would actually be interesting to see uh, a comparison in the carbon footprint uh, of the type of solution that, that, that Tom has been talking about, the concrete versus steel, not just in the production of concrete sleepers and steel sleepers, but the, the, the overall reduction in carbon if you went for the steel solution. Uh, through not having to renew bridges, through not having to have such a depth of excavation. Uh, it would be an interesting one to see. And again, comparing that with uh, the Scottish government's aspirations of uh, reducing their carbon footprint. I'm always a big fan of thinking 60 years ahead, Jim, and I'm thinking in 60 years time, I've got either 84 kilograms of reusable steel sleeper or 284 kilograms of dead load concrete that nobody wants to crush and remove the steel rebar or cast from. Indeed, but, but, but you have to then pay for somebody to crush oh, yeah. and take Logistics. away. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, I guess um, to follow up on that, Jim, uh, I know Lorraine Brown, before she left, uh, her and her team, Daniel Dietre and uh, Amy, had been working up some figures along with the planning team and development team at Renewals um, on the, the carbon impacts. Uh, and I think they've, they've, they've got as far, and if there's anybody in the call, they have to come in and confirm or refute, they've got as far as a, having identified the carbon impact using the RSSB rail carbon tool. Uh, I guess the, the, the next and current phases are um, identifying those options 
Um, so they might not have considered the impact, the carbon impact of a bridge renewal, but they've certainly gone some way to quantifying the existing carbon impacts of uh, the different types of category of, of renewal. And I'm, I'm sure Daniel will thank me if I if I'd say him there's some more work for you. <laughs> um, but, but again, uh, uh, by, by NRDD, um, the, there's, there's a, a new gentleman working uh, within NRDD uh, at a national level, um, Emmanuel Deschamps, and uh, Manny is looking to work up some uh, generic examples of footbridge impacts, um, renewals of footbridge, um, renewals of standard bridge. Um, I think he's already done the platform impact. So again, we'll be still in the pride. Right, thank you, thank you, Brian. I, I, it's an interesting one because, I, as you know, I, I was one of the sort of first people in Scotland to to have the RSSB carbon capture pool training, and of course, I was the big bad man who said, "Does the two differentiate between?" Um, a universal column for electrification. I produced fairly uh, eco economically in, in this country, or or one produced in poor environmental conditions in China and shipped halfway across the world. Is that something that is now being uh, taken cognizance of in in the uh, RSSE? Uh, sorry, RSSB carbon deal. So I guess the, the big problem was um, when, when I was doing the uh, stuff at uni, um, part of the reason that the countries fall out in these uh, conferences um, is, is really down to the fact that nobody's willing to take ownership of the carbon impact. So the, the, the basic example is if uh, China are producing a lot of material and shipping it across the ocean. Um, the UK, developed countries, America, don't want to take ownership of that carbon impact because they're saying, oh, that's the producer. You're the producer, you should own it, that carbon impact. China or India's position is, well, you guys are the end users, so the carbon impact is really your ownership. So that's why there's been such a failure. Um, at, at international level and at the, these major conferences to reach agreement on on a carbon reduction because it's a, it's a bit of a dare I say squabble about who actually takes ownership of that type of carbon. Uh, Indeed, it, Brian, it, I, 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 I cannot I cannot understand that, but of course at the, at the end of the day, I we 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 are the people who are sitting working out the the, the carbon footprint, so. I, if, if I get a piece of steel that's made in Scunthorpe or a piece of, a piece of steel that's made in India or, or, or China, I suppose really I have to account uh, for that carbon. Yep, so I, I, guess, uh, I, I guess really it's up to the funders and Network Rail as the statutory undertaker to say, well, we're, we're talking, if we're talking about decarbonisation and the uh, past 2080, uh, and, and reducing carbon in infrastructure, then we really need to account for that. Um, and if, if it's if it's politically unfavourable, then somebody has to stand up and say, "Look, here, here's the real impact." Um, if if it was a tax or if we were doing proper accounting, then you wouldn't want to buy something that's very expensive in in carbon output if if your policy is to reduce carbon. Okay, thanks for that, Ryan. I've got, I've got an, uh, an observation from a uh, member of those, Ryan Walker, uh, said much of the TBI recommendations are for drainage rule renewals, which are uh, proposed to happen before the track renewal. This doesn't happen very often, though, and you don't get the increase in ballast information life benefit because the drainage renewal isn't happening prior to the track renewal. Is that something that uh, again, a different change in strategy to say recognise the drainage renewal as a higher priority than perhaps we have done in the past. 
Sorry, I missed part of that, Tom. Did, did you say that uh, the drain is drainage. going in or it is not yeah. going in? The proposal is for drainage along with, prior to the track renewal, but rather than do the drainage prior to the track renewal, either the drainage isn't happening and therefore the extension and ballast information isn't getting, isn't being realised because you may be installed your new track renewal, uh, but its feet still wet and it starts to degrade fairly quickly through pumping and fines ingress. Mm. Uh, a, cha a change in policy from Network Rail? Uh, well, my, my, my experience in the past was we, we did those at the same time. You know, so I, I, although it might not necessarily have been on the same night, we, we, we did that as part of a project. Um, I, I don't I don't really know because I haven't taken sight of the, the drainage policy. Well, I know what the drainage policy is, but I haven't taken sight of the drainage plans, as it were. Um, but I thought that was going over to track renewals anyway. It's not very detailed in the question, and maybe Ryan, you could um, unmute and expand on that. If you can't understand you on you on phone rather than uh, webcam. Anyway, one last question then from 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 someone, and I'll, before I bring the the meeting to a close. Andrew? Hi, Tom. Yeah, it's Andrew Anderson here. Um, it was just what you were touching on with bridges. One of the big issues with bridges, of course, tends to be what services run across the top. I don't know how you would account for those in terms of carbon, but there's certainly a problem in terms of um, time to get the utilities to redirect them and the cost in doing so. Indeed, and it's such an efficient way of crossing the railway, isn't it? Is to find a, a road bridge or a, a farm crossing uh, going across the railway and let's just put some services in it. Yes, that yes, and particularly for the likes of the East Kilbride, which you've mentioned, it's fairly urban, so I imagine there are a great number of services in the bridges that are affected. Absolutely, and even some of the more uh, uh, non-urban areas, you've got um, services bridges next to the bridge, so yeah. you've got services in the structure, and then next to the structure, you've a services structure. Indeed. So I, I don't know how you would quantify that. It's one versus the other. Uh, yeah, I, we, I guess we, it, it could go back to that big picture thing you were talking about. Uh, um, is, a, is a lower, more beneficial? Uh, and again, uh, you look at you look at the delay to a number of projects we've had recently. Don't mention the vegetation, please. But, uh, but think about when we come out of confinement, as, as we're in just now, and we want to start doing works again. Part of the issues would be program. So again, if I think about a, a project we had down in the LNE, like, uh, Not Nottingley, Fridley Stubbs Level Crossing, the, there had been a couple of false starts because uh, there were great crested mutes locally. But we were able to get an internal ecologist to come up with a plan and accelerate the, the works uh, to start during the, the normal hibernation period. Um, and it was because we, we were trying to get to meet some ORR milestones. So quite often, it's, it's not just the cost, it's meeting programme deadlines. You know you know what it's like you now having, it, having to run projects um, or, or time projects to coincide with a, a new timetable publication, for example. Um, so quite often the benefit is not necessarily just cost. Uh, the benefit could be program and the social aspect, you know, make it, making that service available or accessible to, to members of the public. Indeed, and it's that every time you look at a project, and there's always the conflict between track RAM and structures RAM, uh, is it a bridge we deck? Is it a track lower? And you look at everything from whole life cost to constructability. Um, and it's it's always a difficult sell at SIFT time to identify at group three, which is your option to be developed going forward. Anyway, on that note, uh, can I just bring the meeting to a close and say thank you very much all for attending. I hope you found it useful. It will be reported in the journal soon, as soon as Jim types up something and submits it. Thanks, Jim. Um, 
and I, I welcome you all in a month's time uh, back online, uh, I must presume, um, where we'll be having a, a presentation by James Watson and Andrew Anderson Esquires. Um, that's Wednesday, 20th of May, online, 17.15 for 17.30 kickoff. Bring your own beer. Uh, and the talk is called Bonus and Canal Railway, 40 years in the making. And I'll leave you with that thought and draw the meeting to a close. Thank you all very much. And thank you very much, Brian. Thanks, Tom. Good night. Yep. Thanks very much. Thanks.